Hi, I'm Gretchen Sable, and I'm president of League of Women Voters ABC, Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids area. Tonight, we're looking at pollinators and how people can improve pollinator habitat in their yards and also in the yards of townhouse associations and parks and all kinds of places like that. Um, speaking with me is Linda Rogers, also from LWV ABC. And then answering, helping us with the discussion period is Laurie Schneider. Laurie is with the Pollinator Friendly Alliance. So here we go. So um, the presenters tonight are myself and Linda Rogers, and we did not practice our transitions. So we're just gonna be talking over one another and um, interrupting. It'll be just like when your kids are all home, so. <laughs> so the um, I'll start out, Linda, and you can chime in, but I wanted to say that the goal of tonight's meeting was A, because pollinator meetings are always great this time of year when you really need to see growing things. And then B, to have people think about ways they can use um, unused spaces for pollinator habitat. So if you, for example, live in a townhouse complex and your stormwater pond is just sitting there growing weeds, well, why not plant pollinator stuff all around that? So looking at some of those spaces <clears throat> that could easily house habitat and think about new ways to use them and then get money to be able to do the project. So um, Linda, did you wanna say anything? Well, I, I was just thinking before the meeting, how when I was a kid, I saw so many more pollinators, um, moths and butterflies that I don't see anymore, Cecropia, Polyphemus, Luna, alfalfa butterflies, um, the, the little tiny blue butterflies, I grew up out in Cedar, Anoka County, and the air was full of those critters. And now it is not. So if I wanna see them, I gotta find creative ways to provide habitat for them and, and uh, enjoy others' efforts toward that end as well, because we need them so very badly. Um, I went to Europe a couple years ago and you don't see birds or insects there. They don't even have screens in the windows. So we don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, green stuff is all around us. So why not make it pollinator friendly? You know, you compare the look of these two, you can see a lot more value in this kind of a landscape. So think about the spaces around you. Are there corners that nobody walks on that are just mowed and sprayed and fertilized but not used? used? Could these spaces be made more alive, more pollinator friendly and easy to maintain? So um, what we have here is pictures from our yard and from Linda's yard. We both have very different kind of pollinator areas in our yards. Mine is on the right there. It's hot and dry where I live up here on the sand plain. And Linda's on the sand plain too, but she's got a wetland in her backyard. So hers, she has a lot more water plants in hers. So you'll see some differences as we proceed here. Um, so it's not just about beauty, but essential ecologic purpose too, because the pollinators are part of the, um, the circle and cycle of life. You know, it's like in the Lion King, the circle of life. They're, they're very important for having the seeds that create the nude plants. And so we need to have pollinators for that. And they're, an essential part of what keeps the world ticking. Do you want to read some, Linda? This is kind of your thing sure. here. Sure, just, and I, there's a little typo in there, so I just read over it. Oh, sorry. Some pollinating insects require specific native plants to survive. So if those specific native plants disappear, the pollinators disappear. And when we lose pollinators, we decrease the earth's capacity to regenerate itself. And there we see some lovely pollinators on butterfly weed. And this is really a year round benefit that we get from these plants. Not only do they feed bees and insects and little tree frogs you see on that middle flower, but they also in the summer, but they also provide seeds for birds and other critters during the winter. And we'll see some more examples of how, pardon? Okay. There goes. Can, I, can I jump in? 
for a minute? Yeah. Sure. You know, that, that last picture, the, the winter scene, I think it's important to let everybody know that they should be leaving all of their plants alone in the fall so that they are up all winter long for the, the birds and the insects to either eat off of or live inside of. Yeah, there are a lot of pollinators that live in the stems of plants. So um, you're right. Bumblebees live in the stems of plants. So you could cut some <clears throat> down a bit, but not cut them off or not tear right. them out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, this is an example. Is it coming here? Yeah, there. So this is the crab apple tree in my front yard. And in the springtime, it's just full of bees and other kinds of insects when it's blooming. And then it has a nice summer. And in the fall, this flock of cedar waxwings, they're kind of hard to see there. The cedar waxwings came and they ate the crab apple tree, the crab apples off the tree. So there was a fair number of cedar waxwings that were in the area for that. And then we were so surprised. I was sitting in my recliner watching football and um, pheasants showed up in the crab apple tree to finish off the, the crab uh -huh. apples. Uh -huh. So it was the same tree from three angles there. So, so it's important for a lot of things. Um, you know, we talk about water quite a bit in ABC. Come on. It's not advancing the slide. There it is. Native plants have deep roots that hold soil and absorb water. So that helps absorb water quality. Um, you can see there on the left, that's Kentucky bluegrass. That's as deep as the roots go. And that's why you have to keep watering your lawn. And you know, it does, it's not very drought tolerant and it doesn't do a great job of um, holding the soil and things. Compare that to the root system of the prairie plants that we grow here. And it's just amazing the difference. Can I come in with one comment about that? If we have these um, native uh, lawns or gardens, uh, we use much less water to irrigate in the summer. In fact, the groundwater we all drink, the greatest use of the groundwater is for irrigating our lawns in the summer. The greatest you know, uh, amount of water that is with, uh, withdrawn is in the, in the summertime for yeah. lawns. Mm -hmm. So um, Mary Jo is the one of the supervisors for the Anoka Conservation District. And one of the things that the ACD is trying to support is um, these little bits of good, little pockets of ecosystems that support a wide range of creatures. So um, the goal would be to not think about, oh, we need 40 acres or we need, we need to do this whole swath. So let's just focus on doing little pockets here and there and trying to have enough little pockets that we do have good um, support for pollinators everywhere. Um, you know, if you're, I used the example of a townhouse association before, if your townhouse association decides to put some native plantings in, you don't have to do a whole lot with it. They pretty much take care of themselves. Um, if you start to see trees coming up in it, you might want to mow it once a year. I do, I have my area, I have invasive trees coming in, so I just knock it down with the mower in the spring in between the time that it dries up and the time that stuff starts to grow. And if you get noxious weeds in, you want to remove them. But mostly, you know, the natives are pretty vigorous and they take care of that stuff. But by contrast, to... grass has... No, I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to just add that if you, if you watch it and weed it for three years, it's, then after that, it's it's quite uh, very good at managing itself. You mm -hmm. can still, you know, mow those trees down, but most yeah. of the plants will, will be native by the third year. Um, so if you have grass, you know, it has to be mowed and mowed and mowed and fertilized and mowed and sprayed and mowed and mowed. And then you have to rake up all the leaves in the fall. So that's a lot of work and cost with minimal benefit to ecosystems. Why not turn those green bits into pollinator habitat? And some of the pollinators that we see, you know, we all talk about, about monarchs. Some pictures coming up here of um, monarch butterflies. There's a, a monarch caterpillar. And uh, I'm sorry, the delay here's a little hard. This one is a uh, monarch 
caterpillar on a milkweed, a monarch caterpillar on butterfly weeds coming up here. And then the finished product, you know, the, these are kind of the poster children for, for pollinators, but there's a whole bunch of other critters out there that are really important. And, and a, a major, I have some pictures. This is my front yard with my pollinator garden along the driveway. So this, we put this pollinator garden in to kind of manage runoff from the roof. So it's a rain garden and a, a place for the pollinators to grow. Or else you can fill up an unused corner of your yard with beauty and life. We'll see that here in a sec. This is the, the hot dry pollinator bed that I have. Um, here you see there's hyssop and monarda, uh, black eyed Susans. Now this next slide is, uh, Linda's gonna take over here and show give us a tour of her garden. And once it comes, she'll start talking here. It's gonna start moving Linda, just be. Okay, so as Gretchen oh, mentioned. Oh, it's not gonna work for you. So you just have to talk about it. It's, yeah, it's just gonna alternate them like that. So go. Okay, okay. As Gretchen mentioned, we have more of a wetland situation where we have our native plants. And actually some of the native plants do span both types of um, terrain, the wetter or the drier. Here you see some vervain that's almost bloomed out and that bright red step flower and down low in the photo, you'll see allium. And if the video were working, you'd see all kinds of bees buzzing around those allium. They just love them so much. So there's a lot of uh, showing of allium here. And the, I note it also in the video that it's different bees on different, different plants. So on one bunch of allium, there were sort of medium bees. I don't know the technical kinds of bees. But on another bunch, they were all very much smaller. And then later on some bone set that we'll see, they were very teeny tiny little insects. So I think that maybe speaks to the specificity of what certain insects like and need to survive. There you'll see some jopai weed. It'll, it'll look back to the allium. Looks like you could you could share some of that, Linda. Oh, that I sure could. And here's there's the mighty Joe Pie. It's just huge and green headed coneflower, um, arrowhead, and that's really down in the water. Blue flags, and all these things are about mm, three to five years old down here. That's just the walkway. You'll see cardinal flower again, yes. the pie weed and the bone set that has all, yeah. that's the white flower with all the teeny tiny little insects. That's bone set? Yeah. There's, there you can see one. So what they did was they took this transition between their yard and the wetland and they just made it this beautiful area of flowers and living insects and little frogs and big frogs and probably turtles and all kinds of stuff. There had been um, a lot of buckthorn in there and amber maple. Those are both invasives, garlic mustard, um, uh, burdock, all the nasties. But once the natives get established, as Mary Jo said, uh, they don't need too much help holding sway over the land. There's the Joe pie. That's kind of such a favorite of so many insects, I think. Everybody likes Joe pie. When Joe pie is so beautiful in the summertime when it gets those big fluffy seed heads or flower heads on it. Yeah. More cardinal flower and later there'll be cardinal flowers. Yep. 
big lobelia will come up that looks the cardinal like flowers i was just going to say the cardinal flowers attract hummingbirds too yes you get lots of hummingbirds at ours good point do you have liatris we do on higher ground mm -hmm. and the madarda here is a cultivar it's not um that isn't native right there but we do have some native in another area and some spotted Minarda too, which I just love. And then we kind of wind up here in a minute with hyssop. Um, my son has done a lot of work at on restoring prairie and he gave me some hyssop seeds one year. And I really never knew anything about hyssop and it's just taken off wonderfully down there. There it is. And again, many insects like hyssop. I and think it's a beautiful scent too. Yes, it smells like licorice. So um, the next part of this talk, we got some slides from a talk by the Exerces Society. Um, they are a, an organization that supports insects and pollinators. This is an example from Chicago. And what they say is if you build it, they will come. So that we need to think about urban landscapes. If you're able to put pollinator habitat, even in a really urban setting like Chicago, you will get um, critters. Uh, some of the urban conservation opportunities that Xerxes noted was home gardens and boulevards, um, neighborhood projects. And then you could look at schools, roadsides, institutions, um, businesses don't, you know, their lawns aren't really used for much. So why not look at businesses? Churches as well will often have a large front lawn. Why not add some pollinator habitat there? Campuses, parks, there's lots of parks that um, get mowed for lack of other, other thing, way to do anything. So why not use some spots of parks? I'd um, like to do a shout out to Grace Lutheran and Andover. They have a fantastic garden area. Mm -hmm. They do. Um, so Xerxes suggests that um, converting laws to something more useful using, you can also do edible fruit, vegetables, and herbs. And we're going to talk a little bit more about flowering lawns here in a minute. So instead of just having grass, you can use dandelions, clover, cell peel, violets, creeping thyme. And any of those things make your lawn um, you know, it's it's still attractive, it's still green, it's still, a lot of them are still low, but they're just a lot more alive and more part of an ecosystem and uh, a great way to do it. So um, some things that pollinators need is to think about, you need to have diverse vegetation for season long nectar, pollen and host plants. So you wanna, when you're planting it, you wanna think about having kind of a, things that bloom early, things that bloom late, things that fill in the middle. Um, like Sue was saying earlier, you want to have shelter for nesting and overwintering of the insects, and then they need to have refuge from pesticides. So that's an important part too, to make sure that you're not spraying or that that stuff doesn't get sprayed. Um, we also, you know, leaving the leaves is important. So um, the new recommendations from the University of Minnesota are not to rake up all your leaves, but to leave them on your lawn. You, know, you can chop them and leave them, or you can leave them in the flower beds, and that's all just fine. And now, um, I hope Lori Schneider has joined us. She said she was going to be here at 6.30. Um, Lori, are you here? Yes, I am. I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, Lori Schneider is with the Pollinator Friendly Alliance, and she can tell us some about herself. And then um, Lori has some resources that she, um, I'll stop sharing now. She sent me some resources and I will, um, I did post those on our blog and I'll send out a link to that so everybody can see that. So Lori, take it away. Okay. Um, well, you've done a really good job of, of covering sort of backyard habitats for pollinators. Um, I guess I'm, I'm open to taking questions, but um, if you like, I do have a very short sort of um, summary of resources um, for all of you to refer to. And I have that in a PowerPoint if you'd like me to share it. 
I think that would be fine. Okay. I think it'd be wonderful. Okay, let's see. And then Gretchen, after Lori's gone through her her presentation, we do have a couple of questions and comments on our chat section. Oh, okay. And maybe Lori can help address those. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots community organization that has gone statewide. So we've got quite a following now. And this at this time of year, we're working on a lot of legislative actions. Um, we have a number of bills that are moving through the legislature. And we're also educating folks on how to get their gardens going. And I know people are all really eager to get, <laughs> get in the soil, get in the dirt and start working with their plants. Um, so just remember that those overwintering creatures are hunkered down until it's 50, consistently 50 degrees or warmer. And that's when their wings can start working. So, and it also corresponds when plants and trees start flowering and producing nectar and pollen. So it's all in perfect order, right? The, the, the invertebrates and the insects, the pollinators, the all the animals, plants, trees, they know when to do what they're supposed to do. Um, this slide just shows the variety of pollinators. In Minnesota, we have cataloged over 460 native bees, which are the heavy lifters. So most people are familiar with honeybees and monarchs, for instance. They're sort of the, um, uh, the flagship species. But really, um, honeybees are not native. They were brought over from Europe years ago, and they're managed just like cows are managed. Um, they, they wouldn't necessarily be here if they weren't brought over and put in hives. But the native wild bees are um, native, and they are not managed, and they pollinate most of our natural environments and also crops. Some of them are specialized, like the squash bee, for instance. Um, wasps are often overlooked, and they are one of the most beneficial insects we have. They do a lot of predation, so they um, keep other pest insects in check, and they also pollinate. Um, flies are not all pollinators and not all our friends, <laughs> but um, there are some flies that are very important pollinators like the siphon fly. Beetles, um, surprisingly, are overlooked and they are really um, ben beneficial for a number of reasons, decomposing in particular, but they're also prolific pollinators. Um, the goldenrod beetle, for instance. Um, and then we're all familiar with butterflies. They're um, so beautiful. They attract our attention. They do pollinate, but they're sort of incidental pollinators as are moths. But don't forget that the moss and the butterfly larvae feed our songbirds. So um, that's that slide. And it's not really a link slide, but I wanted to show you just one um, project that we worked on and just make a little suggestion that if you see an open lot in your community, see if you can uh, do something with it. So here's the before picture and here's the after. Wow. And it, this is the um, first spring after we planted and it has progressively just really diversified. Um, this is, um, you've already been using some of Xerxes Society's slides and we work with them hand in hand on conservation. They have an enormous library of materials on their website, but this is one of the best links here. And Gretchen mentioned earlier that I, um, put together a list of links for you, and this is on that. 
Also, Heather Holm is a local biologist, and she is really one of our biggest pollinator champions. She has put together some really um, useful go-to books on um, pollinator species, and also she has these posters and lists on her website that are really helpful. So that's another. She also has a trees and shrubs, and oftentimes people forget that trees and shrubs are super important. Trees in particular are host plants for many butterflies. Um, if we didn't have some of these trees, we wouldn't have our butterfly populations. They also are important to moths. Um, and another um, plant that is sort of overlooked are grasses and sedges. So the link at the bottom is a new booklet that's been put together and released. It's free, it's online. All these links are on the, the sheet that he, um, I gave to Gretchen for you. But um, there's some really beautiful grasses and butterflies in particular spend a majority of their lifetime at the base of grasses. They hide down there from weather predators. They only really come out when it's sunny and beautiful out um, to collect ne nectar. When the temperature gets high enough, then the nectar is warmed and pollinators can access it. And they also, um, as, of course, mate and do some other things when it's warmer out. And then a bee lawn, which you've talked about. Um, this is another link for instructions on how to put a bee lawn in um, or pollinator lawn. And uh, just an interesting statistic, turf is the number three um, monocrop in the United States. <laughs> number three after corn and wheat, I believe. So it um, so it, it, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe soy in the Midwest for sure, right? Um, mm -hmm. So this is a short list of those of plant lists. Um, and there's also a couple of databases on here, which are really helpful. Uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden has this incredible plant finder resource. Um, along with the Audubon as well, which is on there. Um, and then these are some guides on habitat and gardening. Um, the Lawns to Legumes program for the state of Minnesota not only has that cost share program, but they also have some really good instructions um, on their website and a little booklet that you can download. And uh, that's that's all I have in my my links presentation. I can talk longer if you like, or I can be done. I don't know what you have for your program. Do you have any questions? Yeah, we have questions um, that are on the chat. Do you want to ask the questions, Linda? And I'll uh, I'll try to find that blog post and show everybody where I put the information from Lori. I'm so mute. Linda, are you there? <laughs> Linda's muted. <laughs> so, so the first question, where, I can't even find my chat. Okay, I'm on now. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, the first question or comment we had was, this isn't my situation, but um, Rachel says on another call, people spoke about the trouble getting their condo or um, HOA types to sign on. That might be something really great to put some thought into how to um, open up people's minds to that in those situations. Lori, do you have any insights or experience regarding that? Well, that, that is um, historically a tough group. Um, and what we found works in general is to find one or two, what we call ambassadors that are part of that group. So someone in that homeowner association, for instance, that is a supporter 
of your mission and work with them because it's hard for an outsider to come in and try to change minds. So, um, and with those homeowner associations, we just, I just worked with one here in Stillwater and their pet peeve was some unwanted plants. In particular, they had a lot of willow around this pond and they didn't want to pay. Their big motivator was they wanted to bring the cost down <laughs> and they didn't want to have to maintain all the time. So I think the, the best way to change the minds of a group like that is to show them that you can put in pollinator habitat like a short grass prairie with flowering plants, for instance, in a large area that they're normally dousing with herbicides, which are costly and maintaining, maybe paying a lawn care company. Show them that they can save on costs, maintenance, it looks beautiful, and it doesn't pollute their groundwater. So showing that the benefits, I think, is the best way to work with a group like that. I see Glenda's got her hand up. So put her in the rotation too, Linda, as you're doing questions, okay? Sure. Uh, Glenda, why don't we get right to your question? Okay, I live in a condo association. And I think um, the um, lawn care companies dictate what they do to our lawns and stuff like that. And I think we need to be finding a connection with the lawn care companies and encouraging them. But, you know, if we um, plant a lawn that doesn't need to be mowed, they're not going to make any money, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there is a schedule and they hold on to that schedule because that's where they're making their money. So I think we need to find ways to get the lawn care companies involved. They could They're, use organic, you know, rather than the chemicals. Yeah, there are um, organic lawns now, and there are organic lawn care companies. One is called Organic Bobs, and their business has exponentially increased in the last four years. They are so busy, they can't keep up. There are a couple of others too, but um, that's our go-to, organic bobs. And and then they need to also do the snow removal in the wintertime. They can't just do the lawns. Probably the only mm -hmm. Okay. Because when the board is hiring, they just want one vendor. That would be interesting to have a conversation with people from one of those companies and say, Hmm. Well, seriously, you, I think so. Yeah. What could be your vision for this to expand your own business and feel great about what you're offering to our land and our communities? Mm -hmm. um, we've got a comment from Wes and Cheryl Volkanet about the development that's occurring in Andover. And um, one in particular will build on buildable portions with some wetland remaining, but it means prairie space next to that wetland will be turned into homes and yards. How do we balance the need for nature and natural space with community goals of housing development? There have been community concerns raised with each planned development about the loss of trees and space for animal and bird life that's disrupted. Often the very reason people move to an area is what they lose as developments occur. What do you think, Lori? Yeah, there's a lot of value in natural areas. And I, I think that community, community leaders often lose sight of that. They need to be reminded that there's a lot of um, value in clean water, clean environment, uh, uh, happy, community. Um, and people don't want to live in areas that are contaminated. So property values go up. And I've heard this from a number, number of very um, successful real estate 
agents that people are looking for homes in areas where there's natural areas nearby, there's, you know, walking paths and forest, forested areas, clean water, clean air. So um, we've worked with a number of communities, mostly successfully, but sometimes it's really tough. Again, we have to find ambassadors on the city council or on the commissions that are making decisions for these communities. Um, and we've had to, a number of times, go in and meet with each of the, these people individually to educate them. So it, it's, it's very time consuming. But um, I feel like it needs to be made personal. If people have a personal connection, they're more often to participate or help. <laughs> Coffee's done. Uh, if those of you who are reading a lot in, in the chat section, Laura Moore had a question or had a comment about her own experience. It, it kind of related to what Lori was just talking about. Laura, are you there? And did you want to say more about that? I am here. I, I'm not sure. I guess I was just agreeing with Wes. Um, I'm on the Environmental Policy Board in Ramsey. And basically, at this point, our job on the board is to um, approve various um, apartment buildings, you know, condos and homes being built. That is literally what we've done for the last year that I've, I mean, everything that's come across our desk, which is a little bit, you know, disheartening. Um, and so we've started suggesting to all of the developers that they include native plantings. Sometimes we'll give them a break on the trees that they have to put in when they do a development. We encouraged one of the new builders to put in a natural uh, playground, a park made out of all natural, you know, items from, from this area. We set aside a part of a big um, forest. We were able to save it. Um, so that they didn't get to touch that, then they got a break, you know, on their the costs that they used, they had to pay to to buy the big chunk of land. But it's very disheartening because there's so much of Ramsey that is or was rural. And then to see it just being built up and built up and built up is um it's hard to watch. So that's a great question, Wes. I would love to know. I mean, there's what can you do if somebody buys land and they want to, you know, they want to build on it. I see Julie Trude raising her hand there. Julie? Right. I've um, had a lot of frustrations on this topic over the years. Um, most cities have tree preservation ordinances, but as you look at what happens, you realize they're not really preservation ordinances. Uh, the builder, developer, whoever owns the land, they want to maximize their profit. So they circle areas that they don't expect to take down trees because they're not where they want to put a house anyway. And then they say, okay, look, we preserve those trees. But as soon as somebody wants a walkout and they have to bring the elevation down, trees go down again, and there's not really any teeth in it. Probably the thing that seems to work best is um, many cities have done these open space preservation referendums where you actually have people pay money collectively, tax dollars, and you buy up that land to set it aside because then it can be native. Um, there's not much natural left in a suburban landscape once the engineers review a plan and say everybody's house has to sit up on a hill two feet above the 100 year floodplain. And by then you've mowed everything down and every street has to allow water to run downhill to this pond that filters the water to go into the watershed to keep the water pure. And again, that creates a naked landscape. So my experience is once you talk to the engineers and see what um, their reviews bring to the people who own the land, your hands are tied. And then on the other hand, you also have the Met Council saying, we want you to get more homes per acre on the sewer water main because you've got this infrastructure investment. And that, I mean, if you see the infill in the older suburbs, there's no lawn left when they do some of these projects that have 10 homes per acre. So there's, it's always this balancing out thing and it's, um, 
I even saw the Met Council comments on a big project that went in Andover that just broke my heart. They said, oh, this is a native oak savanna. It would be wonderful to have preserved. And it wasn't in a report the staff, the staff gave our council. Um, I asked for the full report and read that. And they were lamenting that this was going to be home. So right now that's like a big ditch uh, that holds holding water. And then when you go look at the homes, the, the people showing the homes say the city made us do this. <laughs> Uh, so there's so many rules about handling water and runoff and not getting flooded basements and you get have and then there's parks set aside so the place that I think we can do the most good is when you see parks that have excess land is doing some of these gardens and and the pollinator group in our area has been very successful with demonstration projects so it's more of that what you showed on the early slides those little pots of gold that's more and more what we're going to see in the suburban landscape unless we can set aside more land collectively through regional parks and and uh, voter referendums thanks julie um so the next question here is from um sue butler and she wanted to know if she can get the powerpoint and so i'll just take this moment to share and show you we have the abc blog and um on the blog we try to put information. So we have our annual report, our annual meeting next month, but we have building pollinator habitat. So this is the program notice that I put out for um, tonight's meeting. And down at the bottom of this post, I've put all of Lori's links. So when you get to this, you can just scroll down, which I'm trying to do now. There it goes. And so there's all those links that Lori was sharing with us and you can explore those. So, so there's that. The next question, uh, Rachel wants to talk to everyone. Are you out there, Rachel, still? I am. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I just bought my first house. Um, I'm actually down in Southern Columbia Heights, right on the border with Minneapolis. And everybody around here, or a lot of people, especially in, in Northeast, have these beautiful pollinator gardens that seem to have been established for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and it's my first house. I don't have any of that here. And I fully recognize that I need to be patient and learn about the space that I'm in before I go trying to change things. Um, but I'm not patient. So um, as I'm <laughs> as I'm waiting to see what my soil looks like and, and how much sun and shade and all of that I get, what can I do in the first two to three years as I kind of get my teeth around some of those bigger issues? What what are some native plants that I can either put in large pots or ones that if I plant them now can be moved later? Or are, are there things that I can, you know, baby step my way into this so that I'm doing some good now while I can, and then, you know, be a little bit, be a little bit more intentional about it later. But I know for sure right now I've got plenty of shade. Um, I just, I do want to do something. I just can't invest too much in something that I know is probably going to need to change. So please help. If that's if this is the right space for it. If not, you can. Well, no, that's great. Um, yeah. So um, one thing is that you can talk to people that have some of those pollinators growing, pollinator plants growing in your area. So if you see them at your neighbors and they're dividing, you can say, "Hey, could I get some of that?" Mm -hmm. And if it's growing at your neighbors, they it would grow at your place too, most likely. And there's, you know, unless there's something completely different at your place. How, um, how long do you have to wait? Three years, you said? No, it's just, it's, it's a new to me old house. And there are plenty of other things that take priority over like, oh, passive landscape um, investment. But I, you know, I want to start my own garden here and, and looking at I don't know where the best place to put that is. I don't know anything about the soil yet and how things are are draining right now. Um, and so I just know that, you know, I'm probably two years away from really being able to, at least two years away from really being able to make anything permanent or intentional around some of these things um, once I, I get the information under me. I guess I would um, choose your, choose a, a spot that's, most special to you maybe by your front door and start working on that that's that's pretty safe because it's protected near your home your house um and 
I don't know, I guess I would just start planting little by little. I would encourage that neighbor I'm getting plants from to come and help me and give me some advice. Yeah. And Rachel, I would, re I used to live in Blake Park and the soil is the most dense clay I've ever seen in my life. So I would very much recommend seeing what your neighbors have and what lives because a lot of plants in the clay will drown during the winter. So they're all great and fine the first year and they're supposed to come back and they don't because they drowned in the clay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd very much try and get stuff from your neighbor um, if, if you can when they're dividing. But I'd also look at what is growing in your neighbor's yard <laughs> and what looks scraggly and bad because that will tell you that it's not the right thing for the soil. Well, yeah, and unfortunately, no one immediately around me has anything really growing. I, from what I've learned, our kind of corner of the block was um, a lot of like bachelors that lived here for 50 years and kind of took real pride in having their green lawns that are like two inches tall and look perfect, but didn't really put too much like uh, creative energy into putting native plantings or anything like that in and so there's it's kind of a wasteland here right now of of just like pretty yards and um and so yeah i can go a couple blocks south i just don't know enough about exactly like is it all clay here and do i need to supplement do i need to you know haul in like a truck of black dirt to really make something happen which i'll do it's just again that's an investment in the next couple of years versus yeah. what i can do right now well, I would say it probably is all clay, and I would recommend don't haul in dirt, just find stuff that like it in the clay. There are a lot of plants that really like clay. Okay. Well, Rachel, we wish you the, the best of luck as you experiment, and <clears throat> my advice would be just because I am a real hack at this, I just put stuff in the ground and hope it grows. And if it doesn't, okay, I learned my lesson. And mm -hmm. and I would just encourage you to be kind of fearless as you go along mm -hmm. and, and um, learn from others as well. Yeah. Thank and you. And Brian had a question about the uh, bee-friendly lawns and the kinds of plants we would choose to put in those. Is there any concern cultivating non-native fast-spreading species such as clovers, dandelion, ground ivy, our beloved creeping Charlie, et cetera? Would it be better to cultivate native pollinators? Laura, do you have thoughts on that? Well, you know, there there is sort of a um, common recipe for pollinator lawns now. Um, and that includes some of the things that you mentioned, but really any low growing flowering plant works. So some other things, and I put this in, in my list of links, but English daisy, um, violets, asters, even um, lupine, um, you know, a lawn doesn't have to be four or six inches tall. It can be a little taller um, more almost meadow-ish, um, wild strawberries are great, uh, coreopsis, pussy toes are my favorite, I think, but, um, you know, Creeping Charlie came from Europe, it's, as you know, a ground ivy, as you mentioned, um, it's a really good pollinator plant, um, and it's easy to pull out, <laughs> You just grab it and pull it out. And there is a organic um, herbicide, which is not toxic, that you can use on Creeping Charlie. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but organic bobs <laughs> is where I heard about it from. Um, so if that's, if you're getting too much of that, um, 
it's e easy to either rake or pull out or use this herbicide that's new, the organic herbicide. But I forget what the original question is. My best advice for pollinator lawns is to put a, um, when you're first installing your lawn, put about an inch of compost all over the lawn before you seed it with the fescues and the um, flowers, the perennial flowers you're going to add. A lot of people miss that step and it's important and it's not costly. You can have, you know, 10 yards of compost delivered for like a hundred bucks. The next question. Ordinances to prohibit lawns greater than six inches. Um, Laurie, have you been dealing with city city ordinances that kind of constrict people and what they can do with their pollinator habitat? Well, you know, that whole thing happened in North Mankato. I don't know if you've all seen that, um, the media coverage on it, but there were, um, there was a, an older man who was a professor and a botanist actually, who had been nurturing these, this native garden in his backyard for years and years. And a couple of residents complained and the city administrator apparently was leading me, um, leading the city to develop a weed ordinance just to stop people from complaining about this one guy. And unfortunately, that's sometimes how it is in these communities. I'm sure you've, most of you have encountered sort of dysfunctional community um, city councils or commissions where it's one person sort of making decisions on on things and bullying everybody. So what happened in the end with this law, this uh, weed ordinance is the, the professor, the botanist hired an attorney. They got the media involved. It hit the Stern Trib and Mankato's paper and some other papers and it just went, uh, it went public everywhere and they got, they had so many people sending them emails and making phone calls because they're not with the program. They're not with the native plant program. So um, I think sometimes these communities need to sort of just be called out. Um, our, the state of Minnesota has even created a pollinator incentive program for all the state agencies and it's intended to be used in the local communities as well. So lawns to legumes is one of the um, one of the the programs that came out of that initiative and it's intended to promote native habitat in backyards and in communities. So um, there's a lot of information out there that can support that argument. Um, Julie said she wanted to talk to about issues of housing versus wilderness. Um, we're at 7.25 now, so we can go a little longer. Um, I, may... I, you know, uh, Gretchen, I think I, I commented earlier, oh, so okay. I'm good on All that. Right. Okay. Um... And Rachel, are you seeing all the ideas people are giving you for your situation? Yes, oh, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. In Thank the chat? You. Okay, great. I, I guess... Stuff... Yeah, I guess I could add something positive if you would allow. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really think the volunteer groups make a huge difference. I've seen it in Andover. We adopted that bee friendly ordinance and then we have Cheryl Seaman leaving, leading the 
Pollinator Association and the demonstration gardens have just been a really big boon because we always do get people who are moving into their first home and then we have people wanting to grow their own food and people that want to grow plants that are good for the environment and safe for their pets and animals and those demonstration gardens are just a wonderful teaching tool and I, I can't say enough about that and then also it's groups like that that get to kind of knock down the negative um, outlook that some of our professional staff has developed because they don't want to hear complaints. But it takes um, people with knowledge and kind of a sweet approach to things to gradually educate them and find the person on staff they can work with who then kind of um, chips away at some of these old attitudes. And I think the attitudes change as people see things done well when someone moves into a home with a native garden and they do nothing, and then it gets to be nauseous weeds and everybody considers a native garden to be a weed garden. So it takes people working at things and volunteers stepping forward. And I, I think it really makes a huge difference. And then the conservation group has been really supportive of those rain gardens because it helps solve problems and it's economical. So the use of some of the rain gardens in areas of Coon Rapids has saved the city tens of thousands of dollars of storm sewers and storm sewers are really expensive to build. So I think, um, and even the stuff with rainwater and grass and all that cities, actually, we have had to build fewer wells because more and more people are doing those Wi-Fi sensors and not watering as much and just, and just learning. So I really want to applaud the NOCA conservation group for writing informative articles in our local newsletters that inform people about yard and lawn maintenance and the volunteer groups um, they hand out plants often at recycle days and then they educate people about where to grow things and what to grow and and uh, volunteers have made a huge difference in the north metro and i really want to thank them that's true um i see that uh, laurie's added a link here um wilderness in the city is a group protecting wilderness in parks and urban areas she has a person to contact Holly Jenkins, and I'll grab some of these and put them on that blog post as well. And then I added that those of you down in Columbia Heights and Fridley, you're in the Mississippi watershed area. That's a watershed organization located um, on the river across from Psycho Susie's. Yeah, it's have, at um, Marshall and Lowry, and it's yeah. the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. I see you have it in the MWMO.org. But yeah. that's the full and, name of it, yeah. Okay, yeah, they they have lots of resources there and money for projects. And so uh, maybe Rachel could talk to them as well and see what they might suggest. So that would be another resource for her. Um, is there anything I missed in this chat? There's a lot of chat. Linda, anything else you wanna say, Lori? I wanna thank Mary Jo for her your comment that kind of winds up things. The community usually leads new things, not government. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of it that way before, but that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. In Champlin, um, we had the Be Safe group and we had uh, staff members that were totally on our side and it already started that way. And it gave them a lot of um, help uh, from the community, you know, because here's this community group that's coming up and, and asking for this and more of this. And I, I think it goes both ways, you know, when you get some really good staff, that really helps a lot. And we're just, you know, we're really pleased. There's a pond, a, a, a pond that we walk by every day. And it was so fun to see the progression from one day to the next, it seemed, we'd see some new things around that pond. First, it was filled with water, and then it was just mud, and you wouldn't believe how beautiful it became. And all kinds of insects were there. It was just really, really fun. And I, I've i um, tried to, to uh, encourage our, our staff to keep up the good work. It's really, really fun. Thanks. Well, I think with that, we'll wrap up at 7.30. So thank everybody for coming. So tomorrow night, um, we're going to have the Anoka Conservation District talking with us about opportunities there. So um, thank you all.